Okay, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is episode 82 of Balloon Speakers. I'm Dave Hennigman coming in from Fujisawa, Japan. And joining us again from central Tokyo is uh, Ed Chan. Good morning, Ed. Good morning. And joining us today is a very special guest uh, coming coming in from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, Mark Edwards. Thank you for joining us, Mark. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Blown Speakers. Thank you. And um, yeah, so you are uh, you were the mastermind behind the recording project "My Dad Is Dead." who uh, began in Cleveland, Ohio in 1984, and you were active from As My Dad Is Dead from 1984 to 2011, releasing 12 full-length albums. And um, yeah, I know you you have a big uh, following, uh, I guess a, a cult following of um, fans who are very enthusiastic about your work. So we're very uh, honored and delighted to have an opportunity to talk to you today. So well, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. It's always amazing to me that there's still people that are interested in talking about the band 30 some years after these records were released. And it was kind of a, a shock that uh, Robert from SCAT called me up um, last year and said that he was interested in re-releasing, uh, you know, this first few uh, MDID records. So I'm very uh, grateful for that, to put that back out in the public and give some people a chance to get those records again. Um, but it's still a, amazing, something that I recorded, you know, 35 years ago that somebody's still interested in it. I think back to my own youth, and I think, you know, if I was 25 years old, would I be ex excited and listening to 35-year-old music? I don't think so. <laughs> it's, it's a different environment these days. So um, why did, um, so the, the album we're going to begin focusing on today is, was originally released in 1987, uh, right. Peace, Love, and Murder, right? And it was your third, right? Your third album. Um, so why, why did Scat uh, decide to start with, with this album? Well, they actually didn't. The, the first thing was a self-release cassette. It really wasn't an album. And what SCAT did last year was they put out the first record with that self-titled cassette as a double LP. So, uh, and he's not going to take it anymore. It was released as a double LP last year. And uh, I think it's pretty much sold out of its pressing. Um, but I think there's still uh, information up on Bandcamp and various other places uh, where there might be, I don't know if there's any of those available yet or not. I haven't talked to him for a little bit. But uh, yeah, the first two records he put out last year and Peace, Love and Murder has just come out beginning of February this year. Okay. Um, so have you gotten a lot of uh, reaction from those those first two re-releases? Um, I mean, again, I've heard from some people um, who are grateful to have another chance to get the record missed out on it the first time around or became familiar with the band later and you know, a lot of those records have been, uh, early records have been out of print for a long, long time. Um, so, you know, you'd often see copies of them on eBay for, you know, 50, 60, 70, hundred dollars, ridiculously high prices. Uh, so it's <clears throat> gratifying that he was able to put it out and, uh, you know, it's still expensive nowadays to buy an LP, but, um, you know, not to that extent. It's nice to have it out there and available. And I think he did a nice job with the repressing. Sounds good. Sounds better than the original, probably. So, um, yeah, excited about it. Yeah, I just, you know, I'm kind of a completist and I have, I think, almost, I think I have everything you've done except for that first cassette, the original cassette. So, I, and I didn't know that it was part of the re-release. So, yes. Search that out. Yeah. Yep. Can you can you show us the ones you have handy, Ed, if they're right next to you? Okay. Well, <laughs> here, here, here's the Peace, Love, and Murder. It is a cutout, so I apologize. I, I think it's <laughs> used somewhere. Um, and then the first album, right? Um, right. Uh, and I didn't notice this before. I haven't looked at this album in a long time, but I love that 
like you have pictures of yourself for each of the the roles <laughs> in it. And, and you know i didn't i didn't even like realize it before and then uh uh oh let's see i guess this is the first homestead right the let's correct and, right and then uh um the best defense another cutout i used to work at a used record store so i think i picked up some there and then the all of you are the shorter you get so Right. Um, and I have some, the other ones I have on CD and stuff like that. So. Yeah, we did put out vinyl of the other ones um, up until I think the last one that came out on vinyl was Everyone Wants the Honey But Not the Sting. So, mm -hmm. dude, um, <clears throat> so the, I don't think anything, we haven't done anything after that uh, on vinyl. I doubt I'd even do CD any, anymore if I tried to release something. It'd probably just all be online at this point. I don't think people are really interested in that much in buying physical cds anymore so yeah we were talking to some uh, another guy who has a record label and he was you know like for some reason cassettes now are becoming a, like kids are starting to like collect cassettes and so there's people are starting to release <laughs> stuff on cassette i guess because it's much cheaper than cds and then just have, yeah. and have the digital online company sure i mean i could see maybe uh, there's not a lot of devices out there to play them on i've seen a few right. Um, a few companies, like I think Turntable has made a little cassette player um, that's very simple, very basic. But I don't see a lot of places where you can play cassettes anymore unless you have an old cassette deck. Yeah, I sell my <laughs> old one. Still sell cassette mas uh, machines? I don't even, <laughs> I don't even know. Well, and then also, the, like, you know, it's not like an LP where the sound quality is like, you know, um, yeah, yeah. Like fetishize the sound quality. Yeah. I don't think I don't think that that's as important nowadays as it used to be but um yeah i have like a million cassettes of band practices and live recordings and things that i haven't you know listened to because i don't have a cassette deck so <laughs> i wouldn't have been able to separate them uh you know to, to do anything with them but they're just stacked away in the closet it's probably well they'll end up until someone puts them in the garbage <laughs> years from now but you know i have i'm loath to part with them for whatever reason, um, but one of these days, I'll decide to dump them somewhere on somebody. <laughs> Are you still like you had the um, the label the unhinged label for a while? Yeah. Are you still doing that? Or well, that was for the last um, couple of my dad is dead records I put out on my own, <clears throat> and we put the secular joy album out on that label as well that's the group i started after my dad is dead uh, we only did one album and um people again left for various places around the country so uh we lasted about i think two years maybe and i'm glad we got to record that record before uh, we broke up but yeah i think it's my best record honestly uh, i know that a lot of people haven't really noticed it and we didn't really have a big promotional push because we just did it all by ourselves but i think it's the most fleshed out songwriting uh, that i've ever done it's on that record uh, you're talking about uh, a new clear route Is that no i'm talking about the secular joy album oh, which okay. came out after that oh, okay. uh, mm. in 2012 yeah mm. that's the last recording i've done um was with that band mm. So you're not like playing anymore? Or, or you know, I, <laughs> I toy around with the idea. I bring out the guitar every once in a while and play around a little bit, but I, I still have probably 10 or 12 songs written for Secular Joy that we never recorded. I always toy around with that idea of, you know, trying to record those somewhere, but <clears throat> I just haven't gotten around to it. Life has intervened yeah. in various ways. Um. So Ed, <clears throat> we we talked about it a little off off camera, but I wonder if I can ask you again to go back to because I know you're a long term my dad is dead fan. So I, I would like to hear you talk about the first time you discovered them and how you became a fan. <clears throat> okay, got to go back in time. <laughs> um, so um, uh, we were talking before we started recording, but uh, so I I was at the University of California in Riverside and I worked at the radio station there all, the whole time I was there. Um, and I was a DJ and then I was also the music director for a while. And 
Um, I I think the first record, like I think, or the first record that I got to know my dad is dead is peace, love, and murder, and that's that's why like kind of it's kind of a touchstone for me. And I when I listened to it, I just remember being like really blown away. Um, you know, okay, so everybody talks about the Joy Division, you know, like kind of sound and influence and stuff like that, but um but you know i think there for me there was there was more to it than that um and then and and i think and uh, and this is something i hope to talk about uh, with you more mark but um i think what always really stuck out to me about your stuff is the songwriting and i mean i i just i really think you're a great songwriter like both lyrics and and music and um you know the sound you know the kind of sound that you that mdid had just really appealed to me. I mean, I, I, I liked Joy Division, of course, and like post-punk stuff. Um, but yeah, but it, I mean, I think it's really the songwriting that always like really kind of touched me in a, in, a, in, in a way that other, you know, other indie rock bands at the time like sort of didn't, even if they had like a kind of distinctive sound or something like that. Um, and so, you know, from there, I just like, I went back and got the earlier stuff and then I just kept following your career, um, after that. Um, what, one of my regrets is that I never got to see you perform live. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I don't know how much you came out to the West coast. Um, but I mean, I don't remember ever seeing, you know, advertisements for it. And then when I lived in Rochester, New York, um, I, I'm guessing you probably played there at some point. I'm sure that we, we must have at some point. We played a, a lot of shows east of the Mississippi. We, we did not, I think, I only got out to the West Coast, I think, once or twice. If I remember, I'm never with a full band. So it was always just too expensive to travel with everybody out there. Um, I did, it's funny, because I did, the very first tour that I did was right after um, the first record came out. And I played uh, a ton of shows and did come out to the West Coast and played in Seattle and San Fran and L.A. and Portland and <clears throat> all the cities up and down the coast, Eureka. And I played with just myself and a drum machine, the yeah. drum machine I'd used on, um, and he's not going to take it anymore. So it was real interesting and a learning experience for me as to uh, a lot of hecklers, a lot of um you know, people who didn't understand what I was trying to do there. Uh, so it was definitely an interesting experience. And I think it hardened me up for uh, later <laughs> tours <laughs> to, you know, uh, not be, I did have a lot of stage fright when I first started out and <clears throat> nothing to get you over stage fright, like a bunch of hecklers heckling at you, just kind of get your hackles up and, you know, so you get into a back and forth with the crowd a little bit. But um, yeah, it was definitely a different, experience and I think it really helped me open up just because I hadn't really even traveled much before then. I think I had uh, a friend who had, in high school who had moved out to San Francisco so I had been out there once or twice before but that's like the only place I'd really traveled in my teenage years so um, I had it was really a fun experience to go driving uh, across the country like that all the way around to make the big circle basically. Yeah, we were Dave and I were talking before, and we were wondering if you had some uh, like kind of stories from the like being on the road and shows and stuff like that. I mean, you know, you just talked about some of the hecklers and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> and I can imagine, like, in so after the first album came out, like, so what, eighty six or eighty six, yeah, um, like in 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 Southern California that, you know, it's still like that transition between like hardcore and indie, what became indie rock, right? So right. I can imagine like the fucking assholes who would have been at a show, <laughs> one of your shows in like, uh, play faster, you know, or yeah. throwing beer bottles and shit. Well, especially yeah. because the name gave some expectation that it was right. going to be some kind of loud punk rock or right. heavy metal or something. Right. Right. And it wasn't that at all. So. Exactly. Uh, yeah, that I did have a lot of those kind of weird experiences, especially playing um, that tour across the South. I actually went through the South and played in Mississippi and Louisiana and places where uh, college towns, you know, yeah. basically, but still you, people at the colleges then, uh, you know, it was not a common thing for somebody in 1986 to be playing a show with just a drum machine by himself up on stage. You know, that was 
I think Big Black was really like the only other band really doing that around the late 80s. And I, I don't recall if they did it before me or after me, but we were kind of like the only two that were really, and he had three guys with him. So uh, it was a little bit different uh, experience than to just one guy. So, <clears throat> yeah, it was definitely, um, it was definitely unique. And I think it actually helped uh, Homestead to be interested in that it was something that wasn't really, you know, nobody else was really doing that kind of thing. <clears throat> so um, that's how I ended up getting the contract with Homestead after playing, a, <clears throat> it was one of those music conferences in New York. And it was, uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to remember where exactly it was, but it was the CMJ or Rock Pool or whatever. They have those, they had those in New York every year. <clears throat> and uh, Gerard came to see me play. I didn't have any other band members at that time. And uh, said, well, come on out to Long Island tomorrow and we'll have a conversation. So, you know, it was really the fact that it was such a unique thing that I was doing. And I was on a lineup with other homestead bands who, you know, were bands. <laughs> so it really kind of stood out like a sore thumb. But I think he's always appreciated that kind of weirdness in music. And, you know, some of his favorite bands are bands that are never ever uh, to be mistaken for mainstream <laughs> sound. Yeah, and you know, when, uh, I mean, at that time, like Homestead was really putting out a lot of really, like such a wide range of really interesting stuff. Right. And, a, and a lot of bands that, you know, I came across because I was at the radio station, but um, that, you know, I, I think never really got the credit that they deserved. Um, you know, like Antietam was another one of my favorite bands from the yeah. Homestead days. And, uh, Live Skull was good. They had some, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot and of bands. Yeah, you can, you know, <laughs> it, it's really a shame that the label ended up being owned by someone uh, who was um, just. I don't know what the right word is, but he never wanted to re-release anything and he never wanted yeah. to give up ownership of it. And it, it right. just made it, we never could get to the bottom of why won't he let go of this stuff if he's right. never going to do anything with it anyway. Right. I think he thought somebody would eventually come around and pay him millions of dollars for it or something. But <clears throat> you know, I'm not even sure if uh, he's still around or not. But was that the whole Dutch East India Trading Company thing? Because it was always Homestead and then... The yes, <clears throat> yes. So, I mean, it is such a shame. There's a lot of really great records that came out in that time frame that are never going to see a re-release, you know, unless people just, um, you know, say, risk it. And I know a couple of bands tried to do something and got cease and desist letters from still being around, uh, you know, but that was probably 15, 20 years ago. So I don't know what's going on with it now. Um, we'll probably have to think about that in a next year if we're going to end up doing the homestead run but right now it's just really uncertain uh and you know took advantage of a lot of young people making music by having these contracts that were global contracts in perpetuity kind of things people didn't understand the language and kids didn't hire lawyers to you know weed through the contracts and stuff everybody was just so excited to have a deal and to be you know have someone making records for them and putting out records for them so, in, you know, in hindsight, <clears throat> you know, none of that would have happened without that. It's not like if I had to put out all those records by myself, I'd still be, it'd still be thousands of them stacked up in my garage, you know. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. It's like the last couple, uh, the two, the last two my dad has done records, you know, I probably sold a third of the run that I made. So, um, you know, it's, it definitely was helpful in that way, just the promotion and, and distribution was helpful to get the name around to get people to recognize the band. But um, from a economic standpoint, we never made anything off of those Homestead records. So, and it really was like in the mid '80s, like Homestead and SST really dominated, you know, a lot of the scene. Like, um, and you know, it was like the like kind of West Coast East Coast thing. But um, really? I, yeah, I mean, I remember Homestead was like. Yeah, I wouldn't buy everything on Homestead, but I mean, usually it was like, you know, oh, there, there's a new Homestead record, like Phantom Toll Booth or you know, something. Something worth giving a listen to. <laughs> exactly, yeah. 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 Hmm. So.
What what year was it that you toured with the Pixies? That was, um, <clears throat> I think it was either 1990 or 91. I don't recall exactly, but I think it may have been 1990. <laughs> so um, that was... It was the uh, tour, the same tour they played with Perubu after us. So we did the first 10 shows with them, and then they did uh, 10 shows with Perubu <laughs> after us. So I think yeah, I do think that was 1990. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what um, what memories do you have of touring with them? Well, that was a whole different experience for us because... Again, you're the opening band. You've got about four inches of stage space. You've got a strict 30 minutes to play your set and get off <laughs> within that 30 minutes. Not just play the songs for 30 minutes, but get set up, do your tuning, play your songs, get off the stage, <laughs> all that in 30 minutes. So it was much more of a regimented uh, thing. And, you know, most of the people there were not there to see us, obviously. They were there to see the Pixies. So, um you know, they were always very nice to us throughout the tour, um, but it was an education as to what a, a big rock tour really looks like. If I ever had any delusions that uh, I was getting popular on that tour, took care of those for me. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, we had some interesting uh, experiences, especially in the Canadian shows. People were very, very impatient to get us off the stage, so... We had beer bottles thrown at us and things like that when we were trying to play through our set. Um, but there were other cities in the U.S. were were appreciative. So we got good responses in Chicago. We always did well in Chicago. Uh, Boston, um, Denver was actually very nice to us. So there was a few cities on that tour where people actually enjoyed the set. And Charles was a, a big fan of the early MDID records. So it was his idea to get us as an opener for um, that part of the tour. So <clears throat> always grateful to him for that. We haven't exactly kept in touch, but uh, it was it was always a, a good experience for us, I think. And this is like right after The Taller You Are, The Shorter You Get came out. Like, were you touring that stuff or were you playing? It that? is. We, <clears throat> we had just uh, come back from the first tour of Europe and um, on the release of The Taller You Are. And so this was in between that. And then after we got done with the Pixies tour, we recorded um, Chopping Down the Family Tree and then went on the second European tour. So, <clears throat> yeah, that was right in the middle. <clears throat> yeah, and I mean, I, I mean, for me, a lot of the songs on that album, um, I think are really great and like, it's it's too bad that you know audiences were not like for the Pixies tour at least were not like you know ready for that kind of stuff because yeah, yeah. I, I would have loved to see that show I don't I don't I'm not a huge Pixies fan but I would have loved to see it <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah it was definitely frenetic I mean <clears throat> it wasn't our best live performances just because of the situation of you know having to be rushed and having to be very um, economical. <laughs> with how we were performing and what songs we picked and you know things that were easy to do and quick to get on and off so it's it wasn't um <clears throat> it wasn't the best live of our live performances i think we did much better shows but it was a lot of fun we were pixies fans we were all pixies fans especially during that time period i'm trying to remember now i'm embarrassing myself I'm trying to remember what record that was it was the one with the big planet in the middle i think or which Pixies record that was. Bossa Nova, I think. Bossa Nova. I think it, they were playing a lot of songs from that, and we hadn't had the, heard the album yet, so it was a lot of fun to see them, you know, 10 times in a row. <laughs> <laughs> what, can, like, I'm wondering, like, the differences between playing by yourself with the drum machine in the early days and then playing with a band. Like, uh, I mean, I, I imagine it's like a, it was a huge difference, but... Definitely. I mean, <clears throat> you know, the, the big thing is, obviously, when we had the band, unless I recorded the record with the band, those songs sounded nothing like the records. So, you know, that was a, a plus for, for me personally, just because it's it helped with the boredom of playing the same songs over and over and over again. 
But um, for the fans, I think some of them were disappointed that they wanted to hear what, the way the song sounded on the record. You know, a lot of people uh, want to hear that. Yeah. So they're just having a different sound, a different tempo, a different speed, a different drum beats, some extra added lead guitar or something. All those things were different. And to me, made it a lot more fun to play with the band than it was to play solo. Uh, yeah, I'm, you know, uh, honestly not an accomplished musician in any way. So being able to have the sound, the backup sound, made me feel a bit more comfortable playing guitar. And I was able to open up a little bit more than trying to just execute the song from start to finish. Yeah, I mean, the other thing that I, I, I think I really admire about your work is so the songwriting stuff, but then also that like kind of DIY spirit. I mean, you like did it all yourself in the beginning and really, um, you know, did, you know, were able to do that. And, you know, I, that's, that's amazing in and of itself, I think, um, getting, getting that started and then being able to like evolve um, as you did. Yeah. Well, definitely Chris. I mean, I mentioned Chris Burgess earlier, I think before we were talking, who was my engineer and producer during that time. I mean, he had a very good awareness of pop music and structures and, you know, he helped a lot in structuring and making some of those things come together, you know, um, as far as uh, coming up with a drum beat for songs or, you know, vice versa, or coming up with interesting sound ideas, you know, let's try the amping this way, let's try the miking this way, let's, you know, so a lot of the sound, like a taller you are, is because of the way we recorded that record. Um, it was all live, I mean, <clears throat> not live, like the whole thing live, but I mean, in that there were no um, direct sounds. It was all recorded with microphones on amplifiers and in various small and tight spaces and various large and <laughs> loud spaces. So he had a really good sense of that. And um, I think really was important in having that sound come together on that record, especially, which, you know, has been the one that is, has been the most popular among the fans of the band. And, <clears throat> you know, still today, uh, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, I put up a, uh, this is another long story, but <clears throat> it's not related to peace, love and murders. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. um, I had had the tapes, the, the, master tapes for Taller You Are, the big two-inch 16-track master tapes sitting in my closet for a long time. And uh, got in touch with some folks down here after I moved down here. And uh, somebody who knew Mitch Easter said, you know, he's got a studio, big studio here. Why don't you uh, get in touch with him to talk about trying to, you know, do something, rescue those tapes. So <clears throat> we did get in touch and he took all of those tapes and he baked them basically so they would play again some of them were starting to fleck off the magnetic backing so we got the really nice um individual track waves of all of those recordings and so i did some basic remixing at home and put those up on bandcamp so there's uh, a remix of that record on bandcamp and there's also I think there was a good number of songs. It was a double album, but there was probably 10 more <laughs> that we wow. recorded during those sessions. Um, you know, so it could have really, if they're not all fleshed out, but there's a couple of them, I think, that are pretty good that didn't end up on the record. Um, so we do have the waves, and if Robert has the desire, we may try to get a professional remixing of that record. Um to, before we release in a couple of years. But he's going chronologically right now, so. Dave, I, I, I feel like, you know, we, we should go back to Peace, Love, and Murder, and also we should hear some music or something, so. Sure. I... sure. Um, yeah, but I'm, you know, my agenda is flexible. But yeah, um, yeah, so uh, the album we're focusing on today, Peace, Love, and Murder, and again, to quickly show um, people the discography, we're talking about the third album released in 1987. And um, yeah, maybe we could uh, play a track or just a minute or two of a track off this album just to kind of uh, set the stage for the conversation. Um, if you'd like to play the first track, if you could, uh, Force Feed, I think that would set the stage for... Uh, 
the general sound of this record and how it came about and how it was constructed. Um, the intro to that song is is re relevant to that. Okay, let, let me cue that up just a moment. Okay, so we're, we're going to listen to a minute or two of uh, track one, Force Feed. Okay, so <laughs> why did why did you choose that one? Well, so what's really different about this record is it was built like a puzzle. So it all started with that um, weirdly affected drum machine track at the beginning. You heard that was put through like a phaser and distortion boxes and things. And um, <clears throat> every song on that record had that as a basis for it. Uh, so it all started with a series of drum patterns. And when we went into the studio, um, I then added live drums on top of the drum patterns. So it was uh, a very backwards approach to songwriting. So I basically did all the rhythm parts first, the drums, the drum tracks, the bass. And then I took the thing home and spent about three months coming up with actual guitar parts and songs to go over the top of it. So it was... Uh, a very different method of recording that I never did before and I never did again, <clears throat> but I really like the way the, the two sounds of the drums work together on this record. It's probably my favorite sounding drum tracks of all the records that I've done. Yeah, it sounds great. I mean, I, and I, I, I'm sure, you know, this is probably the first song I heard of, of yours. And even now, I mean, it really just blows me away. I mean, you know, there's, uh, the, the kind of Joy Division sound, but I mean, it's just, it's so cool. It sounds so great. Um, I, don't, I don't know if this is like, a, is this a remastered version of it or the original? I don't, I'm not sure, but I mean. Yeah, I'm not sure what what's, was played uh, there, but. <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it sounds great and it's just so catchy. I mean, and it was like perfect for like, you know, college radio at that time in 87. Yeah. And I think that just again the the work that Chris did to get the big sound out of the drums that that record was recorded on an eight track machine, so it sounds really big for being recorded on an eight track. I think um, so. That's <clears throat> and uh, I think that's was a lot of fun for me to do that to build it. I think it was one of my most I wouldn't say it was the most fun record I've recorded. <clears throat> There's another one that uh, is different, but this one was from a building the song from nothing into a song <laughs> i think was one of my favorite things because i really went in the studio to start recording with no idea what the songs would end up like 
<clears throat> and that was recorded at Beat Beat Farm Studios. Is that right? Yes, correct. Beat Farm Studios in Willoughby, Ohio, which is probably about 15 minutes from where I grew up. So that's uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you were probably sleeping one night while we were doing the drum tracks at four <laughs> o'clock in the morning. Um what why did you decide to open the album with an instrumental? Um, I think that to me again, it just um set the tone for the whole rest of the record. I think uh I do like doing instrumental songs and I have done quite a few of them in the past. There's a couple of other records I've opened with instrumentals. Um, the Taller You Are record opens with an instrumental also, for lack of a better word. And I just like some of the songs <clears throat> to um, not have my voice in them. <laughs> so I don't know how else to describe it. But, uh, you know, to me, I, I'm not really thrilled with my singing and never have been fond of the way I sing. Um, I think I've learned over the years to do a better job of it, but especially on those early records, I was almost more talking than singing on a lot of them. So, um, <clears throat> you know, and I didn't want, there's, that song to me was too good to try to ruin with a bad lyric <laughs> or a bad voice. And I didn't think that, uh, even though I had tried to come up with something, nothing just really seemed to fit vocally. So uh, I decided to just go with it. Um, yeah, so I don't know when would... Oh, D Dave, did you have something? Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just going to, since songwriting came up, um, and again, uh, to me, I, th I think you're a great songwriter, and I was wondering if you could sort of talk us through the process. I mean, you just did, I guess, for, for that song, but um, I mean, I think one of my favorite songs on this record is Babe in the Woods, um, and, and so that one has lyrics, and so, uh, I don't know, if... if if there's some way you could talk about the process of songwriting, like you could focus on that song. It doesn't have to be that song, but. Um. Well, I mean, every song, every album uh, has been different from the approach pretty much. Um, a, a lot of the songs, I think, depending on the period, you could say uh, like this period, um, the very first record, a lot of that was recorded in a, or the, idea of the songs germinated by playing in a large uh, warehouse behind the Kinko's downtown mm -hmm. Cleveland. And because there was such a huge echo in that place, just having a guitar and a drum machine sounded really big <laughs> and it really was attractive to me at that time. Didn't all come across that way on the record um, as sounding that big, the, the songs that we did with just drum machine and vocals. Uh, so we added drums on some of the songs on that first record. The second record, of course, I talked a little bit about, you know, co going in with just the drum patterns and starting with nothing. I would say most of the time, you know, with a band, it's all different because you practice, you know, practice up the songs in a certain way and then go in the studio and record them. Um, or sometimes those don't work out and you end up going back and doing everything myself. <laughs> so there have been situations where we've recorded songs with a full band that just didn't sound the way I wanted them to sound. So went back and did it all on my own. <clears throat> but mostly, I guess, probably more than half the time, my songs will start with a guitar riff. And for some of the records, it's been an acoustic guitar riff, and some of the records, it's been an electric. Um, so it varies. And I usually practice or play or try to songwrite with a, dr a backing drum pattern. Um, I've had six or seven different drum machines over the years um, and have used those to assist, especially when I'm feeling a little bit blocked in terms of everything sounding the same or not coming up with something good and just experiment with the rhythms and making weird rhythms that will make me come up with something different sounding. So it's basically the guitar and the drum machine that start the process and the usually I can work through, you know, it starts with a riff and then eventually I will take multiple riffs I've recorded on tape and try to find things that match. Like riffs that would make a good chorus part to a riff I've got recorded for a verse part. Um, <clears throat> and uh, 
uh, eventually pacing those together, um, come up with some basically at least things that I could use as skeletons for a song, you know, patterns. And the vocal parts are always the hardest to do. Um, I have literally hundreds of songs, riff songs like that, like I just described to you with a verse and a chorus that I never came up with vocals for. Um, on those pre-mentioned cassettes that have lain around, hundreds of them. Um, <clears throat> so I was very prolific in terms of coming up with the guitar riffs in the late 80s and early 90s especially, but um, the vocals were a lot harder to come by because I really wanted to say something with the songs. I didn't want to just um, slap something on there that rhymed just to get a song out. I mean, I didn't want to say, I didn't want to have my songs be about silly things or things that didn't matter. Um, I wanted to say, I wanted to communicate something um, to how I felt and what I went through growing up and all of that on the record. So I guess that's why it was so hard because some of it was kind of putting myself out there, a lot of the older stuff and in a way that was uncomfortable and probably was uncomfortable to listen to for <laughs> some people. But um, I mean, it was honest and it, it represented where I was at the time. Um, Peace, Love and Murder, a lot of the concept for that record was, <clears throat> you know, I was, uh, did not, I wouldn't say, I mean, just going back to the beginning, I didn't have a happy childhood. I had issues with my father, obviously, which is, you know, why the band name is what the band name is. Um, but, you know, I really kind of related to uh, the, um, I didn't relate to, I didn't want to say this the right way, I didn't relate to mass murderers in that way, but I was fascinated by how someone who is lonely and has had a bad upbringing and has had a violent past with parents or whatever, how they could get to that point where they could do that. And a lot of the ideas and songs on that record are about that. Um, just thinking about how someone could descend into that from, you know, being quote unquote normal or being in a place where they're not thinking those things. Obviously that topic or subject matter is not improved in the 35 years. So I didn't fix things by putting out Peace, Love, and Murder, but uh, things are still, you know, if, if now even more so in our society, people are isolated and becoming, uh, you know, um, shaped by propaganda and by falsehoods and things and you know believing in a worldview that has no basis in reality or fact and those things kind of lead to alienation you know and um, I think we have such a problem in this country especially with uh, gun violence just because of you know the readily available way to uh, utilize those feelings guns are so readily accessible that people who wouldn't think of doing that years ago now have this readily available tool to say, I'm going to express myself in this way. <laughs> so, I mean, it's been, it's been very, uh, it's always been an interesting topic to me, but it's been very disturbing to see where we've come all those years ago. I thought surely in 30, 40 years, we'll come to a solution on this and we'll stop this from happening. But it, it obviously has not worked out that way. Actually, we, Dave and I were talking before, so go ahead, Dave, you should talk about it. I mean, especially the last track, Fireball, I feel is yeah. about that topic, right? Right. Um, mm, yeah, and still very, very relevant today, unfortunately, right? Yeah. Well, it's like people, you know, it seems like a lot of these people are backed into a place where they feel like there's no other option, you know? Um, I mean, you can feel like you've got to end things and not be suicidal, but you, why some of the people, um, why some of the people choose the targets they choose, I don't think I'll ever be able to understand that. Mm -hmm. um, so the lyrics, I just, I have the lyrics in front of me, right? So <clears throat> I'm going to wait for the right time of day when the square is full. I'm going to wait till the sun shines in their eyes so they'll never know. I'm going to go out in a blaze of glory. I'm going to burn my name into the pages of history. Today's the day I'm going to make it to the headlines. You're going to see my name everywhere. And um, it re really made me think of um, the 4th of July last year in Chicago, right? The shooting at the parade 
And um, it was a young guy who, you know, he was a he was a rapper and he had a YouTube channel. So he wanted fame, you know, to, to some degree. And then he, you know, he chose the most, you know, horrendous way to achieve that he could have possibly chosen right but um i mean just when i heard that song it immediately made me think of that um but unfortunately that's one of dozens if not hundreds of examples we could have used right. you know? well, that particular song uh, was written about i mean it was the um the influence for that song was charles whitman who you know is the famous austin texas tower shooter uh, in, back in the 60s and the cover of the record is him uh, holding oh, wow. two rifles on the beach. Oh, wow. So that's actually Charles uh, Whitman as a child. Wow. So again, making the connection, uh, you know, if you expose kids at a young age to weapons like that, um, and, you know, they have these social problems, family problems, <clears throat> it, it gives them an angle to release those things that they should never have to start with. But... Mm. It just it was interesting to me that he uh, was in a family that had guns at that early of an age, and that picture was just a perfect, um, a perfect image of where he came from to where he ended up. Mm. How how did you decide the title for this album, "Peace, Love, and Murder"? <clears throat> well, I think it's. Um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of the timing, but there, there's always been the phrase peace, love, and understanding or peace. You know, I I wanted to think of something like it seemed like the hippie era in the 60s was, um, you know, I was very into the music back then. I was very into the 60s music. I wasn't that old. I was only, you know, under 10 years old, but my brothers were into the music. And so uh, I was very into the love era when I was young and growing up, which was uh, not the way the world was when, as I started experiencing it in my 20s. So it kind of was like a replacement for that. About the, um, how about the images on the, on the back cover, right? There are three pictures of you. Why did you... I mean, why did you choose these photos? <laughs> um, well, I think it was kind of the the general idea, like Ed mentioned earlier, was just to be silly and show three pictures of the same person uh, playing the instruments on the back. Uh -huh. <laughs> and the pow, pow, pow is the sound of the drum machine. And the vocals are, I think, in the top left one, I'm shining a light down the stairs. Or No, I, there was another one where I was. That's not the one that ended up on the record. There was one where I was in that same spot, but I was shining a flashlight at the camera. Um, so shining a light. And then the bass is just sitting on the couch playing bass. <laughs> okay. Uh, Ed, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, I was just going to pick up on what you were saying about, like, for the lyrics, you know, you wanted something true and real. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I really think, you know, you're able to do that, especially, you know, on these songs in particular. Um, uh, you know, I mean, it's it, it, your lyrics. I, I To be honest, I don't really pay that much attention to lyrics when I listen to music in general. But... Um, I mean, it always seemed to me like your your lyrics were really heartfelt and 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 real, and I, I and it seems to me like that's probably like kind of what speaks to a lot of people about your music, um, and you know, kind of creates this like kind of devoted like kind of cult following. Um, is that I yeah? You know, so again, when I when I was listening to this album in in eighty seven or whatever, I I don't know that I was like you know relating to the lyrics directly, but. But I could, always, you know, it always felt to me like it was real and it wasn't like, you know, uh, bullshit or whatever, you know. And <laughs> and, and uh, so it, even even though I wasn't necessarily paying attention to the meaning of the lyrics, it still spoke to me, I think, in a, in a very like kind of visceral way. Um, and, you know, and as I look at the lyrics now, I'm looking at the lyrics for Babe in the Woods. I mean, I think it's there. 
you know, it's, it's not like overly complicated, um, but mm -hmm. it's, but it also like is able to capture like an image or a scene or, you know, whatever you want to call it or in a mood that is like, I think really powerful in, in a lot of ways. Um, so. Yeah. It's kind of, I mean, it's about a conversation of, you know, a younger person in this particular uh this particular play, I'm the younger person, and there's an older person who has a lot more life experience, and I'm complaining about something, and the older person is like, give me a break. You you don't know what you're talking about. You have, haven't experienced these things. You don't know what it's like to be lonely. You've never been with somebody and lost them. You don't know, you know, that's kind of what that whole song is about, the feeling of get out of your own head and start appreciating, you know, things that you do have. So... Yeah, I mean, that's kind of where that song came from for me. Do you often like like sort of think in stories or like this kind of... I do. I think in conversations a lot. So a lot of my songs sound like just person talking or having a conversation. Mm -hmm. I think I think conversationally in a lot of the lyrics that I write, it's about people saying that something or hearing something. Um Again, I, I like to talk or like to write lyrics about interpersonal relationships more than other things, just because I think that's a more global thing that reaches everybody. I mean, I did get into a little more politics in my last couple of records, but I think you close yourself off from an audience when you do that. And even though things are important and need to be said, you know, maybe the rock and roll person is not the person to say those things. I don't know. I mean, I feel like I did feel very strongly like I needed to have an opinion about some of these things that happened, especially around the Bush presidency and then um, you know, the war in Iraq and all of the things that happened then. And <clears throat> the, to me, what seems obvious, the development of a propaganda society that's just crushing us as a country right now. And that was all, you know, starting back then in the late uh, mid to late 90s. And it seemed obvious to me, but a lot of people it doesn't seem obvious to and still doesn't. So um, anyway, <laughs> I think if I did go write some more songs, I probably would, again, not be writing outside of myself like I, I did for a while. But, you know, I, I think people, when they start off in a very insular. I mean, when you're a child, right, it's all about you, right, when you're a kid. Everything is about how the world affects you. And when you get older and into your uh, later life, it starts to be more about the people around you and your friends and your family. And then it becomes more about the world and what's happening in the world. And then as you get older, it starts shrinking back down again to family and friends and then, you know, relationships. And I, I think it's a, it's kind of like a balloon where, uh, once you see a lot of the world and you see a lot of what's going on, you kind of tend to, all right, that's, I don't really need to, <laughs> need to be involved in all that. So I feel like it's, you know, my life has kind of been that way and I've been much more focused on family in the last few years and I have been on music, even though I, I do miss it. And I still listen to a lot of music. I mean, I'm probably one of the few independent people who does listen to Spotify and does pay Spotify a monthly fee to listen to stuff. Dave a lot does of do. Complain about Spotify, but um, you know the the amount of music that is available there and the choice, and it's just incredible to turn on your computer and you have an entire library history of songs available to you. I'm, I'm not sure there's anything else like that in the world right now. I mean. You know, uh, iTunes was always a huge disappointment to me. I can't tell you the number of times I lost entire libraries of music due to switching computers or, or device failing or whatever, just this, you know. So I really like having it all in the cloud where you can just go listen to it. And it's true they don't have everything, but between them and Bandcamp, I think yeah. there's been a, a uh, I'm a big Bandcamp supporter. I use them for, I have lots of releases up on Bandcamp. I think they're doing fantastic work for paying artists and making sure that artists get their fair share of the music they sell. I've probably made actually more money through Bandcamp than I have through any other source ever. Um, wow. So, you know, it, it is uh, definitely, and we're not talking like enough to actually consider it a job or anything like that, but, you know, probably making $5,000 a year 
uh, is three thousand dollars more a year than I ever made before. <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of uh, you know I've always had to have a job. I've never been able to, to just make music. That was always my dream when I was young that my job would be just making music, but I never was able to do that. <clears throat> Yeah, Bandcamp's great, and you know the the Bandcamp Fridays where they they waive yeah. their their fee, and then also like some people um, like have like you can subscribe and basically become a patron, right? And like right, um, like kind of give them money like every month. And, yeah, I, I I think Bandcamp. <laughs> I I have to the check out Spotify. I've, never, I've always avoided it. But. The only thing Bandcamp doesn't have is the interface that. Um, finds like things for you like pandora is good at that and yeah. spotify is good at that and you know they don't have you basically have to do all the searching yourself and know what you're looking for they have tags what they call tags but you know those are assigned by the people that put the music up so they can call it whatever they want to call it so <clears throat> it's really there's no real good search engine on bandcamp yeah. to really help you find things that you might be interested in as opposed to you know the other uh, couple of big services. So and and the way they're, <clears throat> I'm gonna I'm gonna say the word AI <laughs> decides uh, you know to tell you what you might like to listen to. And I, much as I hate the whole idea of a robot telling me what I want to listen to, I have to admit that sometimes the playlists they send to me, I like eighty percent of them. So you know it's <laughs> hard to deny the efficacy. Um, if you do a lot of listening on the platform, you'll end up hearing a lot more of what you want to listen to. So I appreciate that about it. Did I think I read in an interview, I mean, maybe it was a while ago, but that you were doing a radio show in, in Chapel Hill? I did. I did for a couple of years. There was a low-power FM station down here. WCOM, I think it was. <clears throat> and... Um, they advertised for, uh, you know, DJs and radio shows for a while when they first started up. And <clears throat> I did that, I think, probably for about three years uh, with them. It just got to be too much to have, you know, three, four hours every week dedicated to that and coming up with things to play. They had no music library to speak of, so it was everything that you brought in yourself. And it pretty much predated the easy availability of stuff on YouTube and other places where you could just queue something up with a laptop and play it. Couldn't really do that back then. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it was a lot of work. <laughs> and I couldn't really say I got a lot of feedback from it. So we didn't really get phone calls or anything like that. It's hard to know if anybody was really listening. I mean, but, you know, going back to the old days, the, you know, late 80s, I mean, college radio was really such a fantastic thing. I mean, for me personally, but I think also for like really laying the groundwork for a lot of independent music. I mean, oh, and yeah. it was amazing that the, all the stuff that would come through. Um, uh, Dave and I were talking about like someone like Jandek, like he, he mm -hmm. I, I remember being at the radio station and all these records would just keep coming from Corwood, Texas or wherever, wherever it was. And it was just, it, it, and it was amazing. And we'd actually play this stuff. And, you know, I, I, again, I don't know how many people were listening. This is kind of out in out, right. outskirts of Los Angeles, but, you know, I mean, I, it, I think it really did start. You know, it, it really did help people like get in touch with music that they probably never would have before. So like so pre AI, yeah. like that stuff. and but that you, was part of developing a whole scene. I mean, the, the radio, the clubs, um, <clears throat> all the things that were called. That's why it was called underground. Is there was this whole uh, industry of rock music that was kind of above that on another level, the big commercial radio stations, the giant arenas, the stadium concerts, whatever. And then all these little bands and the touring vans all across the country never got any airplay on those big things. It was all college radio and, and independently owned clubs that supported that whole scene. And it was really kind of cool in a big city, being in a big city and Cleveland State being right in the center of the city you know, everybody was listening to it before they went to shows or after they get out of shows or whatever at parties, the stations were always on. There were three of the stations in Cleveland, WRUW, which was at Case Western, and WJCU, which is at the John Carroll University, and then Cleveland State. And then there was also Baldwin Wallace, 
which was to the southwest and had less of the signals. You couldn't really get that much in the city. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it was it was a great time. A lot of competition, a lot of friendly competition, a lot of cooperation. I think all four stations at one point joined into the called the College Radio Coalition and did a lot of cross promotion and you know worked with each other to help each other get records, have like, you know, all kinds of things like that. So it was definitely uh, an interesting time, I think, uh, for, you know, something that's was pre-internet days, obviously, 80s and 90s. So it was kind of almost like the start of that community. I feel, I feel like there's much less of that kind of community nowadays, but it could be that I'm just less involved in it and so don't really see it. But it seems like that kind of community doesn't really exist anymore to me. But like I said, I could be. Or if it does, it's online, yeah. right? And it's yeah, not right. necessarily yeah. inter personal interaction. Um, yeah. In Chapel Hill right now, I mean, I, I assume like um, University of North Carolina has some kind of college radio station. But like, is there is there college radio? Does it is it still there and doing stuff? There is. I mean, Duke has their own station, WXDU, right. and uh, Chapel Hill University of Chapel Hill has uh, has their own station as well, WXYC. But <clears throat> they don't have that kind of. Uh, like WXYC, the Chapel Hill Station is pretty much all over the map. I mean, they have always encouraged programmers to play a rock song and then a classical song and then a free jazz piece. And then, so for me, it's always been kind of hard to listen to. I'm not the kind of person that's uh, everything musical I can appreciate. So um, that's been something that they've kept throughout the entire time I've been down here, as far as I know. I just listened to them in the car the other day, and they were kind of still doing the same thing. So uh, the Duke station seems to have more of a show focus, where you know one entire show will do this, and one entire show will do that. So, I mean, I don't know if it has as much of the impact that it seemed like they did in the old days, but uh, with all the internet available stuff. But they're they're still going, and they're still... Um, you know, still broadcasting down here. So, cool. um, shall we play another track just for our our viewers? Right? Where do you okay. think? another? <laughs> sure. Well, because because you said um, you know you don't like to hear your voice, but I mean, yeah, I'm I'm a fan of your singing voice, and uh, you know, the first track we played was. Yes, the first track we played was an instrumental. So I thought for our viewers, it'd be a good chance to uh, perhaps people are hearing you for the first time. Is there a track off this album you think would be a good entry point? Well, since Ed talked a little bit about Babe in the Woods, why don't we uh, try that one so you talked about it, people can hear it. Okay, just a moment. Okay, so we're gonna listen to track two, Babe in the Woods. Okay, and I think I'm just gonna play the whole track. Uh, check it out. Bring it in the 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I stick a little plug in here, if you mind. Uh, sure. I want to let everybody know that, again, this record that we're talking about here has just been re-released on vinyl. And uh, it's available at realscatrecords.com to put out on the Scat Records label, label that has done a bunch of things for uh, Cleveland bands in the late 80s, early 90s. And restarting again. So uh, just put out a couple of Spike and Vane uh, records who are real uh, people in Cleveland would know about them. Um, kind of a, a, a wide ranging band that um, was pretty lights out live. <clears throat> and that's the plan that Robert played guitar in before Prison Shake. So anyway, um, it's on scat, realscatrecords.com. Thank you. Hmm. So, so SCAT was, was inactive for a while and they're starting up again. Is that right? Yeah, well, he's, uh, they've been doing a little bit um, more recently. So he was always active and the, the band, um, the label really got a little more attention when it put out the first couple of Guided by Voices records. <clears throat> and there's been a constant ongoing demand for those records that are on his label. So He's kind of lived off of that for a while and uh, just recently has started with reissuing some of the old Cleveland stuff um, that he was involved with. So um, the band The Dark, an old punk band from Cleveland and Spike and Vane, which was kind of like a big mixture of kind of like reminded me of Gun Club and Birthday Party. If you put those two together, um, just some really wacky stuff. <clears throat> so he's reissued those and um, of course, the first two My Dad is Dead records and plans to reissue a few more things from old Cleveland bands from the 80s over the next few years. So there's apparently a demand for us. I'm not really sure why, but <laughs> apparently 35 years later, somebody said, hey, that's pretty good. <laughs> I just recently discovered, I guess it was your first band or maybe second band, Thermos of Happiness? Thermos of Happiness, yeah, that was the it's first band. So, yeah, it's great stuff. I I hadn't I didn't know about it before, but I just recently started listening to it because I think it's free on Bandcamp, right, or something. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, we were around for probably 1980 through 1982, thereabouts. So um, played a few shows, did some really basic recordings, um, um, wrote a lot of songs, <laughs> played a lot of practices. Did a Joy Division cover the inter interzone? We did. We did a Joy Division cover. Um, and so, you, yeah, it was, you mostly played drums in that band, or I played drums in that band. Yeah, yeah. but you, I think you sang some too, right? No, we had a singer. Uh, his name was Jim Smagola. He was a singer uh, for us back then. And let's see, my friend um, Tim Gilbride played guitar for a while with us, and Tim's been. Uh, a friend of mine for many, many years. He's been on a lot of my records as well as a guitar player. And I've played in a few of his bands as well, um, played drums in a few of his bands. So 
uh, we have a long history going back. And uh, Ben Axelrod was the other guy. He's the guy that pretty much started Dermis of Happiness. And um, he lived up in the Coventry area. So uh, I don't know for um, Dave, if you might know where that is. Yeah, yeah, I used to live around there for a while. Yeah. Hmm. So he used to live in a, a house up on in the Heights. And we played in his basement, practice in his basement with his huge chow hound behind a very weak looking fence, which I always, <laughs> the dog always scared the crap out of me because it was like a bear. I mean, you ever seen a chow, a, a dog, a big chow? Yeah. yeah, it's very scary. So I practiced, I played drums really fast down there in that band. <laughs> so I I saw that footage on YouTube of Doug Doug Gillard playing mm -hmm. with you, right? Yeah. And I think it was labeled like the, the final My Dad is Dead show. Is that right? We did, yeah. We did a uh <clears throat> we did a uh goodbye show in Cleveland uh in 20, I think it was 2011. Um at um, um, losing the name of the Beachwood uh, Ballroom in Cleveland on the east side. <clears throat> and mm. um, yeah, I had basically everybody that had played with me except for, well, there's a couple of people that I shouldn't say that. There was everybody that played with me from Cleveland <laughs> came to that show and played a little bit um, with us on that uh, last show. So Doug had been in and out of the band for a while. Um, he played um, uh, a lot of the songs on Chopping Down the Family Tree, and he toured with us in Europe the second time around. We switched off on guitar and drums. So half the song, you imagine uh, the great guitarist that he is, he was playing drums and half of my songs was just how smart I am. Let's take this great guitarist and put him on drums. <laughs> he was actually a very good drummer too, um, which, you know, he's just multi-talented, but, um, He's uh, obviously gone on to bigger and better things <laughs> with Guided by Voices. Yeah, I saw him. Solo, solo career. He has a lot of his own solo records as well. Yeah, and stuff he does with Bob Pollard outside of Guided by Voices. Also. Yes. Interesting stuff. Um, yeah, I saw him perform last time I was home. I was home in August for about a month. I saw Guided by Voices play. And uh, yeah, Doug, Doug looked amazing. <laughs> yeah. He's a ripper. I don't know how he got that talent to play um, from a very young age. He uh, just had that natural talent. So I think like a lot of the musicians in Cleveland, I don't think he ever had any formal training or anything like that. Um, none of the people that I know who grew, grew up with any kind of formal instrumental training or even knew how to write music. So um, a lot of us just uh, played what sounded good to us, basically. So I've never learned how to write music up to this point. So I couldn't translate my songs into any series of notes for you to play by yourself. <laughs> what what venues? People, go ahead. I was, I was I wanted to ask what venues you played at in Cleveland, like in the nineties. Um, well, we, there was a lot of different places. Let's see, we played. Uh, Obviously, the big one in the 80s was the Pop Shop. Um, and then there was, that was underneath the old Agora that's burned down. Whatever, I don't know what's there now, parking lot probably. Um, there was the Fantasy on the west side in West 117th. There was Peabody's Down Under, which was in mm. the flats. Um, there was the Cleveland Underground, which was up on uh, Euclid, the Euclid Tavern, which was mm. right up in that same general area. Yeah. Um, so yeah, a lot of different places. I hope I'm not forgetting any. The uh, Grog Shop, <laughs> of mm. course, it's also in the Coventry area. Um, let's see, Speak in Tongues, played there oh, wow. twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we played at a bunch of different places in town. After they had us a couple of times, they didn't want us back again, so we had to rotate, you know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I saw a tortoise that speak in tongues. I, I yeah, I remember correctly. It's an interesting place. I mean, it was definitely a um, definitely an interesting place. <laughs> That's all I can really say. But it has a book written about it. I think that is available online. But it was kind of like a co-op, an artist co-op, and um, there wasn't really anybody in charge, basically. So <laughs> it was a kind of good luck but it was a fun place to play. And a lot of the early days in Cleveland was like that. I mean, there were 
places that were not really managed by anybody. And people just show up and play, you know. So there was a place called the Lakefront Cleveland that was uh, I'm trying to remember exactly where that was, but that was just like a big long hallway with a bar at the end of it. Um, the punk bands used to play there a lot. So, <clears throat> yep. Long history, You're making me feel old now, remembering mm -hmm. Pop Shop, Lakefront, <laughs> these old places. I mean, it sounds great though. I mean, like with all these, you know, places that people just started up or people could play. I mean, um, you know, in LA, I mean, it's so, it was so, you know, in a way, com relatively commercialized where, you know, there were the certain places, but, you know, you had to know someone or uh, have some kind of connection or fame or whatever to get into yeah. those. I mean, of course, like when I was in bands in college, I, I mean, we were playing at like pizza parlors and shit like that. I <laughs> um, yeah. So. That's famously how, uh, I don't know if you know the Cleveland band, Death of Samantha, that's famously how... Oh, yeah. They got started. Their first show was at a burger joint or something. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they got kicked out after playing two songs. <laughs> I remember getting paid in beer, like, <laughs> yeah, which was fun. You were lucky to get paid at all. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. we had a few of those where we ended up not getting paid after doing our show, but it was a wild, wild west out there <laughs> back in those days. You have club owners pull guns on you and things like that. I mean, it's just kind of crazy. But I, I, I'm amazed sometimes to think about how we used to do that, sleeping on concrete floors and <laughs> um, just going through all of that. It seemed like a lot of work for little, little gain back then, but it was what we wanted to do. It was our, I'd rather do that than sit in an office back then. But, exactly, yeah. So I'm sure you were doing the whole sleeping in the car on tour kind of thing oh, yeah. on people's couches etc et yeah i mean we we had to depend upon the largesse of our fans many times sleeping in their houses which always were not that pleasant we have a lot of stories about the fly house or the the whippet house or the chicken coop house or the various places we slept on the floor in unsavory conditions <laughs> definitely <laughs> don't want to be unappreciative of your fans, but we did have some crazy situations where uh, sleeping was not possible. <laughs> yeah. I like that story I read, uh, you, you told in an interview, um, when you opened for Modern English. Yes. And uh, what you left, you, you wanted to distribute records to some degree and you left a box of records on the stage and- Right. What, what, what exactly happened? <laughs> well, it, it was while I was playing again, it was uh, right after the first record came out. So I was playing by myself with a drum machine. And one of the people that was waiting for Modern English, I mean, this was their I Melt With You days. And of course, there were hundreds of people in the audience wanting to see them. One of the impatient people reached out and grabbed the box of records and started flinging them throughout the club. Um, so I don't know if anybody actually kept any to go home. There definitely were a lot of broken ones on the floor after the show. And uh, I did keep one. I should have looked it up, should have brought it out for posterity, but I didn't bring it out. I do have one that has a boot print on the front of the cover, which I thought was kind of funny. But <laughs> <laughs> I kept wow. that one for posterity. Was that in Cleveland? That was. I, I that was that was at uh, Peabody's. Yeah. <clears throat> so, one of the good things there is I, I ended up being one of the few bands that was kind of, you know, modern. I don't want it underground rock or whatever you want to call it, indie rock back then. I got to open for a lot of bands that came through town. So that was one of those early. I think it was one of the first big bands that I opened for. Um, but I opened for a lot of bands in Cleveland that were way above my pay grade, Butthole Surfers, Creatures, uh, um, you know, big, big bands. So I definitely got uh, got a nice thick hide from playing some of those shows. <laughs> yeah, wow, wow. So I know Ed wanted to ask about tracks off some other <laughs> albums. If if we have time, if that's, is that, um, do, do we want to continue with um, 
focusing on this album or we could broaden it a bit and uh, discuss a few other tracks from other albums. Is that I'm okay? Fine with, fine with either. Yep. Yeah. What What do you think, Ed? You had you mentioned. Uh... Yeah. So okay. Um. I so I, if I think about it, I think the song, my favorite song, uh, "My Dad Is Dead" song, is "A Man Possessed." Off the taller you are, the shorter you get. And I, I it was it was funny because I was reading in an interview where you were talking about this, how it was a double LP and like um, you know it really could have been a single LP and some of the tracks were like kind of throwaway mm -hmm. uh, or filler or whatever. And a man possessed was one of those that you identified as a filler song. And I was like, Oh my God, that's like, <laughs> oh, man, what and you did in the interview, you did like sort of say, you know, but that's just what I'm thinking. You know, there could be people out there who love. And uh, I don't know. So yeah. So uh, a man possessed is, it's one of those, I, I mean, that album, the whole album, I think is great. And um but for some reason, a man possessed really like kind of struck me. I mean, because it's kind of melancholic, but it's really, mm -hmm. I mean, it's also really catchy, also. And I think it's got great riffs. So I don't think it's filler at all. I think it, it's great. I think it's great. But yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that's the song that I like the music to that song a lot, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I thought the lyrics could have been uh, stronger. I thought yeah. the lyrics and the vocals both could have been stronger after, you know, hindsight is always 2020. Sure. It's one thing about my records is I'm always, listening back to them thinking I could have added this guitar part or I could have added this harmony or I could have sung this chorus a little differently this way, you know, in a quote unquote better way. Mm -hmm. So um, it's always been just <clears throat> my perfectionism with how I wanted it to sound. But I did, I do find that a lot of the songs that I feel that way about that, well, this isn't really a great song end up being favorites from the fans, which is yeah. funny. Um, yeah. Somebody wrote me the other day, not the other day, but um, actually it was a few months ago, somebody was writing about um, the possibility of this Taller You Are coming out again and said that his favorite song was Sweet Company, which is a song that I would have never, ever thought would be anybody's favorite song. <laughs> but um, I think, I'm not sure that's on the double album version. I think it is, but I, I don't recall 100% if it's on the it's, double album version. It's it's not on the track list I'm looking at right now, right? Uh, sweet, sweet company, you say? Yeah. Huh. It's not. Yeah, so that must be one of it those. Is. It is. Well, it's on It's on this version. It's on the album. It's not on the CD, correct? Oh, so I see. The CD wasn't, back then, the, the technology, I don't know if it's still this way, but the CDs couldn't be longer than 70 minutes, so we couldn't fit oh. the entire double album onto a CD. So that's one we had. To, we cut that one, and we cut... Um, an instrumental called Meep Meep, which <laughs> we cut that one. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I think we cut the intro to um, World on a String. I think we cut that. So there's a few things on the <clears throat> record that are not on the CD version. And I think there's actually one extra song on the cassette version. So it had this, like mm. three different versions to it. But <clears throat> that was funny to me. It's just like, well, you've actually got the, you must have the album because <laughs> that wasn't on the CD version. Uh -huh. But it is, has, it's always surprising. Everybody likes a different song. And I can't seem to, when we play live and people actually call out songs, it's funny because it's like, well, I haven't played that song for 10 years. I don't know <laughs> if I can remember how to do it. So, <clears throat> but that's a good thing. Uh, um, yeah, definitely, I think uh, definitely. Yeah. And there's an interesting story about the cover art, too, because there's this kind of minimalist cover art, right? It's just the. Black. So that's the CD version. And that you can thank Homestead for that because they were too cheap to put uh, pictures on the CD version. So they just decided it was too expensive. We're just going to put these black and white bars on the CD version. Oh, yeah. So that's why the album has the full artwork as it was intended. And the, the CD does not. <clears throat> but, so you know, these are all pictures of my father's automobile, which he left uh, after he passed away. And um, my friend Tim at the time really needed a car. He didn't have a car. So I decided uh, to just give him my dad's car. And we drove it out to his house and sat in his house for a while. We're doing something I don't recall. And all of a sudden he looked out the kitchen window and he saw smoke coming from the kitchen window. And he's like, what the heck? Looked out and the car had caught fire in the driveway. 
So we just laughed about it. It's like my dad's one last FU <laughs> set his car on fire so nobody could have it um, after he passed away. That's a great, so, that would have been a great name for the band. My dad is dead and he says, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, those those are those pictures of the car burning up in the street. Um, oh, this car, absolutely. and on the back See, cover is a picture of firemen standing over the. I don't know if you have that, but a picture okay. of firemen standing over the. Yeah. The, uh, desk. Oh, there you go. Here, wait, Ned. Let me uh, clap oh. this. Can you hold that up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> uh, um, well, one thing I was going to say is like so. Um, another thing I really like about your 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 oeuvre, your work as a whole is um i mean i you know i think the the lyrics can really be really touching like with a man possessed but um also there's i mean humor and like kind of dark kind of humor um that comes out and like stuff like that like the cover of the record so. yeah i don't take myself too seriously um i, I think that you you kind of can't do that if you want to stay yeah. sane, <laughs> kind of, you know, I went through a lot of dark times and a lot of dark places in, in my younger days and, you know, have kind of learned to soften that a little bit with, you know, just making fun of things. Mm -hmm. um, Let's see. Um, <clears throat> so, Ed, I know you also wanted to mention uh, this shine the double uh, seven inch yeah yeah what um well i mean so i mean uh i i guess what i was thinking about this is that uh it, it's interesting because you took some of the older songs like from peace love and murder and redid them and and i i think it, it and you know really well like the the new version of 20 yards deep is you know was instrumental on the on peace love and murder and then you added lyrics to this one but I mean, that song just rocks. And I mean, I, you know, I used to listen to it all the time and it was just, um, yeah. And even in the, in the re, uh, the revised version of Babe in the Woods too, I really like, I mean, all of it I really like, but it, I, but it was, I think amazing how you took the, the earlier versions and, and, and redid them and like made them sound so and big. This is kind of what, <clears throat> I mean, this record came out right after I started really playing with and touring with the full band. So this was Prison Shake backing band for me. So this was Chris Burgess and Scott Pickering. And um, also um, Robert Griffin played on a couple of the leads on this record. So we had started doing some touring together as a duo. So Prison Shake and My Dad Is Dead would tour together and these guys would do double duty. Give them a lot of credit for that. So uh, we'd alternate quote unquote headline spots. We didn't really have a headliner, but we'd kind of do a uh, do each other songs. And for a while, even when Chris broke his finger, I ended up playing bass with Prison Shake. So it's, you could say we're really <laughs> tied together uh, as two bands. But um, that was a lot of fun to re-record those in in a way with the band because, uh, like I said, I talked earlier about how playing with the band, the songs were so different. I can't imagine what all those early records would have sounded like. They probably would have sounded like Shiner, so you know, have a different sound to them, um, you know, than they would have earlier. And it's not. I don't think one is better than the other, but I think one is a little more mature. I think the Shiner songs have, are a more mature, fleshed out versions of. You know, they don't have quite as much angst and a little more. Um, I don't know, a little more of a professional sound to them than the early yeah. records. I Most I people know how to play their instruments. So <laughs> Scott and, and Robert and Chris know how to play their instruments. So I was always a pretender. <laughs> a good pretender. Though, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's really, the, I mean, the riffs that you came up with, though, I think are like, you know, that's the thing. I mean, and then again, putting it all together, packaging it as a song, because, you know, like, so I was in stupid bands when I was in college, but, and, you know, I thought we actually had some interesting sounds, but we could never write a song. We could never like put it together uh, in such a way that it was actually a song. It was just like basically jamming kind of thing. Um, yeah. Well, I've been in a few bands like that and I've known quite a few people who are like that. They could yeah. be otherwise very talented musicians, but they're not songwriters. Exactly. And, Vice versa. 
<laughs> so it's been, um, I mean, I really like playing with a band. I miss it. I miss the friendship and the camaraderie. Um, it, it is a rather isolating thing to do everything by yourself and feels like you don't have the uh, editing that someone else might have, you know, thinking about listening to what you're trying to do and coming up with their own uh, aspect on it. I would have loved to have been in a, a band with two songwriters. That's, I never got the opportunity to do that. Um, that would have been a lot of fun, I think. Like uh, Paul McCartney and John Lennon <laughs> going at each other. <laughs> yeah. Like the two guys from Spinal Tap, who were they? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna... okay. So, all right, we're going to play uh, a snippet from the song A Man Possessed, okay, off the The Taller You Are, The Shorter You Get album. It's track 15 off the double album. And, um, yeah, it's interesting because Ed says it's one of his all-time favorite My Dad Is Dead songs, and Mark has referred to it elsewhere as a throwaway. So let's uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's let's check it out. Who's right? Yeah, <laughs> showdown. <laughs> It was just before my one of my favorite parts, but that's okay. I can go back. I can go back. Wait, okay, wait. Okay. Da, 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 da. All right, here we go.
Okay, so the first thing I I'll, I want to say about that 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 what we just heard, and so that why I insisted that you play that moment. So um, I don't I don't know what to call it. Um, I'm sure there I, there must be some kind of musicological term for this, but um, that moment, like when it goes into that change, um, is I don't know. Like it, it's for me, it's really like euphoric. In a, in a way it's like almost like drugs in a way so the other song uh that does this for me is carousel lumbra by led zeppelin off into the outdoor <laughs> there's that you know it's got this like kind of part and then it just goes into this like like kind of dreamy like kind of moment and that's what happens in that song for me and that that that's why i really wanted to hear it the other thing I'll say about this song is, and this is like kind of like embarrassing personal information. Like, so when I was in high school, um, I, I was in a boarding school and I, and I, you know, I had my own room and I used to uh, play the New Order song, Leave Me Alone, like <laughs> over and over again in the dark, sitting in my room. And this was before like, you know, digital technology. So I had to actually record the song from my from the record over like multiple times on a cassette tape and then just play it because I couldn't like you know just like uh have it repeat and and you know it's funny because it, it, it's not really like I was depressed or anything I mean I for some reason I I just felt like I had to do it and and this song also I mean I, it would be I think fills that like kind of same spot like it has this like just kind of mood that's you know, melancholic or whatever, but um, I don't know. Yeah, it's just special. That's why it's special to me. I mean, it, it just kind of hits me in that way. So anyways, there's my um, my confession. I, I think that the point that you make about the change, about being this like euphoric change, I agree with you. And I think there's a few songs like that have done that for me. I never really, until you just mentioned it now, and I really thought about this song in those terms, but I can see where you're coming from. Like, if you think of a song like Yes is Relayer, the big, long, 21-minute Relayer, and there's this huge buildup in the middle of it, and then it bursts into this big, melodic thing. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's, it's a pretty incredible break from what they're doing. It's just like, uh, everything's really chugging along, the drums are going to be... And all of a sudden, it's like... <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah. orchestral. Yeah, it and, becomes like very expansive, right? Exactly. And, yeah, that, I, I love that. I love that in songwriting to hear that kind of change. And I've always kind of aspired in a lot of songs I've done to try to have some kind of change that breaks up the pattern of the song. Like there's a lot of uh, my songs where there'll be an ending piece that's completely different than the rest of the song or something thrown in the middle that's completely different. I've always enjoyed doing that just to because I've always liked that in, in other music. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, so you mentioned, uh, in addition to Peace, Love, and Murder, that SCAD is also uh, reissuing the POW EP, right? Or yeah, so there's a little story behind this. Is the, the POW EP was how these three songs were originally intended to come out. So this is um, right at the uh, end period of the Homestead contract where um, I had done the three uh, records that I had owed them. And so we started to do, uh, think about, you know, where am I gonna go with another label? And Scat, we, Scat and I had already started talking, uh, Robert and I had started talking about the possibility of doing the next record on Scat. And so this record was supposed to be uh, three songs that were going to be the debut EP uh, out on Scat Records before uh, the Shiner record. And it contains uh, two songs that actually ended up later on the best defense because there was a contractual dispute, whatever. And we ended up having to put out the best defense on Homestead. But <clears throat> uh, it was supposed to be this first uh appearance of these three songs was supposed to be on this EP. So this is uh, the way uh, Robert thought would be best to release these three. Um, and again, uh, all three of these appeared on the Best Defense album, which may not have a reissue. So um, 
that's why we're kind of just putting this out as an EP because that was the original structure for it. And just a comment, I don't know which song you're play, attending on playing here. Uh, my favorite of these three is In the Morning, but a lot of people like Anti-Socialist. Um, I, I just want to be clear that uh, it's not because I don't believe in socialism. <laughs> it's not that kind of anti-socialist. Uh, it's more about being a, an anti-social person and having a hard time dealing with uh, crowds and other people. So, but whichever, if you're going to play something, I would recommend in the morning. That's my favorite of the three. But well, well, let's do that. Definitely, yeah. Track track two in the morning. All right. Um, Okay, Be before I find that track, I guess I'll take uh, this moment to right, say thank you to everyone for watching, right? Um, all right, well... Um, <laughs> Thanks to Mark for yes. spending two hours with two record geeks or two music geeks in Japan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you, guys. This was a lot of fun. How, yeah. is, uh, how is life in Japan for you all? Well, it's yeah, good. I mean, we're on, um, we're on break now. So it's okay. it's it's nice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at the moment it's nice. But, uh, you said you're both in Tokyo, or one's in Tokyo and one's in, uh, he's in Yokohama. Yokohama, but in, um, in the Tokyo okay. area, it's not far. So, okay. um, yeah, it's and I've been here later this year. I will hit uh, 25 years. I've been here so long. Wow, long time. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. And, uh, yeah. I was just reading a story online the other day about people in Japan don't like to travel outside of Japan. <laughs> so there's something on CNN about how uh, nobody wants to go outside the country because everything they want is there in the country. Uh, uh, yeah. I think there are a lot of people like that. I mean, re recently because of COVID, of course, it's just a pain in the ass to go. Yeah. And, you know, Japan had some of the strictest quarantine. Are we rec well, rec recording? We don't need to go. Yeah. But there was, a, you know, it was if if you went out of the country and came back, you'd have to quarantine in a hotel for like three days or whatever. I mean, so it was just not worth it. Crazy. But yeah, I mean, I, I do think there are people in Japan who feel like, yeah, it's pretty much all here. And why go to another place? Yeah. But yeah, no, life in Japan. I, I, I like living in Japan a lot. I've only been here like 10 years, uh, unlike Dave. But mm -hmm. OK. All right, so we're going to go out with uh, track two on the uh, POW, right, 12-inch uh, single record. The track's called In the Morning. And uh, yes, Mark, was there something you wanted to say about this before we... <clears throat> Just want to say that uh, it's uh, kind of a sister song to the song Nothing Special, which is on Taller You Are. And this is the only song I've ever recorded where I had a respiratory infection. So you may hear that in the vocals. But... Um, I just want to thank you guys for the opportunity to come on and talk. It's been fun. And just a reminder that uh, these two records, Peace, Love, and Murder and POW, are uh, reissued on SCAT records. And you can uh, listen to them, look at them, buy them maybe, if you like, on realscatrecords.com. Okay. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank, thank you, Ed. You, thank you, David. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Simplicity of it all